So you see, we are well steeped in history, and, and that is very important. But also at the Harlem Book Fair, we project, again, what is possible. Given that which we have been given, what is it that we are charged to do? What is our responsibility? So at the Harlem Book Fair, our conversation is where books meet culture. What does that look like? Yes, there's books, but what does that memoir look like in conversation? What does that book on hip hop culture look like? What does that book on fashion look like on a runway outside with the other exhibitors at the book fair? We not only want to talk about books, we know that where we live is in feeling our, ex our experience. We live, we survive because we know who we are. We know our core. And this is the conversation that happens at the Harlem Book Fair. I call it an outdoor book party. You know? So thank you so much for coming. I have the honor and privilege of introducing um, a, a dear friend, a colleague, a professional, someone who has, through intellect and intuition and sheer willpower, has worked her, made her mark through publishing. Uh, her name is Malaika Adero. She is the uh, vice president and senior editor of Atria Books, and she's a Renaissance woman. She is a, a dancer, uh, she is an artist, and in her current, uh, in her current effort, she has a, a new magazine, homeslicemagazine.com. So, you know, so she knows to play in the space of words. She's going to talk to us today about the state of black publishing. Not an easy conversation to have. You know, we are both challenged and both presented with the opportunity of digital publishing. And beneath all of that is telling the right story and still bringing it to market. What is in all of that? Malaika will tell us. Malaika. Please. Yeah. Thank you, dear. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's um, great to see everybody here. Um, the Harlem Book Fair is one of my favorite um, book events. Um, one, because it's in the neighborhood that I live in, so it's easy for me to get here. Um, the other, as you heard from Dr. Muhammad, as you heard from Max Rodriguez, um, is this setting here. Um, Dr. Muhammad talked about uh, Arturo uh, Schomburg, who laid the foundation here as a black bibliophile for this collection to rise, for this center, this uh, depository that is so important, not just for us in this community, but in the world to be built. Um, Dr. Muhammad's leadership and the family of the Schomburg are carrying the beacon um, for the legacy that Arturo Schomburg, James Baldwin, um, our recent literary giants who he named, uh, who recently passed on, Maya Angelou. Um, also there is Amiri Baraka, Jane Cortez. Um, there have been too many, you know, who have passed on recently, but they left us a legacy and they left us in charge and they left us a body of work and the lessons and the instructions. It's just for us to pay attention to that now and carry on. Um, I was flattered by Max's um, invitation to make this talk, you know, and he calls me up and just says so casually, I'd like for you to talk about the state of black literature in 15 minutes. And I'm like, what? You know, um, first of all, the state, the one state, and what are we talking about black literature? I'm an editor, of course, language is important to me. And before I could even, um, first of all, I asked him for a couple of days to think about it. You know, how was I going to talk about this thing we call black literature, um, this thing we call publishing, particularly at this time when it's so complicated, there's so many issues, there's so many breakthroughs, um, there's so much extraordinary work, um, there's so many problems. Um, 
So what exactly will I be talking about? Well, I'll be talking about black people, meaning people of African descent here um, writing and publishing primarily in America and in that reach the, the rest of the world. He and I are on the same page uh, to think in terms of global I am. Um, it, it is how I think, it's how most of the people that I think around me, um, and that is how we need to be thinking more in a systematic fashion in order to reach more people and touch more people and advance our culture and heal the world, really. Um, so I can't think of it as a single state. Uh, it's more like um, the world of storytelling um, because that's what it's about. Um, I want to try to do a few things in this introductory talk. Thank goodness there'll be more people speaking after me who can continue the conversation. Um, but I want to talk about a bit about the conditions in which storytellers work. Uh, I want to re raise questions is and issues concerning readers and reading in general. Um, I'd like to point out some important things to know about how books and reading products are now published and distributed and how you can learn more um, and keep up with what is too often the hidden treasures um, right in our midst, you know, the work, the new work that is available to us that we often don't know anything about. Max asked me to speak from my perspective as a person who's worked in the world of literature and publishing for, for decades. Um, I'll forgive him for reminding me of how old I am in this business. Um, for the last dozen years, I've signed up authors and, and edited and managed book projects for Atria Books at Simon & Schuster. That's my wage-earning job. Um, I also work in community, um, producing programs that bring storytellers to audiences and to readers. I write and I publish um, independent of my corporate ties. Um, I've done this all of my working life. Um, I've done this because I love it. You know, I love hearing stories and telling stories, not only in book form, I love them in lyrics and rhythm and melody and acted out on stage and danced and painted and told on the front porch or on the stoop, um, on television film, everybody does. This is the most profoundly and uniquely human thing that we do, is tell stories, hear stories, um, it's how we define ourselves. It's how we process and make sense of, of life. Um, I just decided to do it, uh, to make a living doing it. And I had many people help me along the way in figuring out how to make a, a living at it, but it was my family who got that started. It was my family who taught me the many ways that reading and writing are important and fundamental in our lives. My great-grandmother told me stories to settle me down at night before bed. Um, she told me stories of strange characters called Tar Baby and Br'er Rabbit. I thought she made these stories up herself. Uh, I didn't hear about um, folklore and uh, Joel uh, Chandler Harris and, until many years later. Uh, my great-grandmother was born in the late 1800s and passed away in the 70s. She told me real-life stories, and she told me other made-up stories. She told me how her community and her family and how she lived and survived. I heard stories about places in East Tennessee earlier in the 20th century called Guntown and Browntown. Um, I know more about slaughtering a hog than I need to know because of my great-grandmother. Um, my uncle, Joe, read aloud to me the lines of Shakespeare that were my high school homework assignment. He was an actor, made no money at it, but he was also an adjunct teacher at Knoxville College and worked as an x-ray technician for his day job. It was he who introduced me to the work of James Baldwin. And it was James Baldwin 
who impressed on my mind Harlan. 